Okay. So yesterday we were talking about uh, you know Brownian motion and then in much greater detail about random walks and then um, we went on to discuss diffusion process okay and how these are related together and in the very beginning I was talking about you know a larger particle you know a larger molecule or you know or a smoke particle in air contained in a box and that particle is performing a Brownian motion, okay? So I'd very briefly sketched that and from there we went on to much simplified uh, uh, setting where, you know, we were assuming that the time and space sets are discrete and we started talking about 1D and 2D random box. So now today I will exclusively focus on uh, Brownian motion and uh, more on the dynamical features of it, like, you know, the dynamics of the Brownian particle, okay? So, before I start, I wanted to flash a slide where, you know, I wanted to mention some of the historical figures who have contributed uh, to the understanding of uh, Brownian motion uh, and, st and stochastic processes in general. So it all started with Robert Brown with his observation of uh, Brownian motion of pollen grains in, in water uh, in 1827. And I'm not going to talk about, you know, prehistoric uh, observations and other things. Then a concrete theory arrived roughly like 80 years uh, later where, you know, Albert Einstein provided, you know, explanation of theoretical explanation of the Brownian motion. And based on, I mean, then Jean-Baptiste Perrin provided experimental verification of the Einstein's theory of Brownian motion in 1908. And he was awarded Nobel Prize for uh, this contribution uh, in 1926. And there are many other important uh, uh, contributors, uh, for example, Paul Langevin and Smoluchowski, Ollenbeck, Einstein, Wiener, and many others. And you will see that they will pop up one by one once we start, okay? So what is Brownian motion that we have been talking about? So in, you know, in a very broad setting, what is this phenomena? So it's a random motion of a small, a small particle immersed in a fluid, okay? We discussed it yesterday. And... Who are the usual suspects? We even saw a video yesterday. So pollen grains, dust particles, or particles of colloidal size generally have been found to show Brownian motion. But what is also true, and uh, the concept of Brownian, uh, or the theory of Brownian particle has been extended to situations where Brownian particle is not a real particle at all, okay? So we are going into some kind of abstraction and that's where the power of this uh, concept of uh, Brownian motion or the theory of Brownian motion comes uh, into, you know, in its full glory. And instead it can, uh, instead it can be some collective property of a macroscopic system that behaves, a, uh, that behaves as a Brownian particle, okay? So what it could be, for example, uh, it could be, you know, the concentration of any component of the chemically reacting system near thermal equilibrium, okay? And the irregular fluctuations in the concentration, okay, in time can correspond to irregular motion of a dust particle, okay? That kind of an analogy we are talking about. So if you remember yesterday, someone asked, you know, what is the purpose of uh, the variable S n that I had introduced, right? Uh, for 1D and 2D uh, random walk. And I was telling you, you know, you are, I'm just introducing, you know, some uh, fluctuating variable and in StatMac, you know, we will often deal with such variables. Uh, and, and I mean, we always end up in such a situation where we have to worry about uh, fluctuating quantity and we have to study that. So now what I'm saying, let's say, you know, let's go beyond the very literal, uh, you know, walk, uh, literal walker, which is performing a Brownian motion, but rather move on to more abstract 
you know, property where this can be used very effectively is that, let's say some collective property of a macroscopic system is performing or is behaving like a Brownian particle. The example that I gave was that of, let's say you take a, you know, a, a chemically reacting system of uh, se uh, uh, consisting of several components, of course, uh, and it's like uh, near thermal equilibrium, okay? So since it's composed of several components and it's chemically reacting, so the concentration, you know, will fluctuate in time, okay? So all I'm saying now, this, you know, fluctuating concentration can be regarded as uh, some kind of a Brownian motion, okay? Which is similar to the irregular motion, which is performed by a pollen grain or a dust or some colloidal particle. Okay, so that's that's what I'm saying when we are making this concept of Brownian motion or this theory of Brownian motion more abstract. Okay, so having said that, uh, I would also mention that we will come back to these concepts, you know, in subsequent lectures where we'll be talking about in greater detail about fluctuations, various stochastic processes and, you know, random variables. Uh, and we would try to qu quantify them. We will talk about different kinds of noises in the system, okay? We will also discuss something called as 1 by F noise, which occurs in, I mean, it, which is so ubiquitous, and we still lack, you know, uh, a good understanding of it, uh, why and how it arises, and why it is so ubiquitous, okay? Uh, 1 by F noise. We there, there's a, there would be a little, you know, um, module or, you know, a few lectures that we will devote to it. So in that context, we will come back and talk about uh, uh, this uh, noise business in greater detail, okay? So now, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about the dynamics of a Brownian particle, okay? And, and so what I'm going to talk about is also uh, called as Langevin description, okay? So, so the Brownian particle and its motion appears to be random, right? This is what we have been discussing so far. But even though it appears random, it must be describable by same equation of motion as any other dynamical system, right? Yes, sir. Right? And so what are those equa equations of motion? Like in classical mechanics, it could be, you know, Hamilton's equation of motion or Newton's equation of motion, right? So same set of things should be applicable to the Brownian motion, right? Or the Brownian particle. Because what do you have? You have a particle embedded or immersed in a fluid, right? So, and it's, you know, moving around. And uh, since it's moving around, what is happening? It must be acted upon by some force, right? So it must be acted upon by some force. And as a, in response to that force, it should be performing some kind of, I mean, you know, it should get uh, accelerated and move around, right? So basically we should be able to write equation of motion, the, you know, the very conventional thing, things that we have been doing. Uh, someone says uh, she is she's not able, Aritri says she is not able to hear me. Is it same with everyone or just with Aritri? Just uh, with her, sir. Uh, just uh, so, Sidi, can you coordinate with her? I mean, in the chat box, maybe. Okay. So, now let's focus on the Brownian particle, you know, the sub, you know, uh, and let's say something more about it and make some assumptions about it. So let's consider a spherical particle that is going to be our Brownian particle, okay? And let's say for the sake of it, you know, it has a radius A, mass given by capital M, and the instant that we are talking about, it is at position X with velocity U, and it is immersed in a fluid of viscosity eta, okay? So, so just to repeat, so what I'm saying, the same deterministic equations uh, of motion that apply to usual uh, particles that we have been discussing so far should also apply to brand new motion. There is nothing special about it, okay? 
So, and then how do we proceed? So, for simplicity, we assume a spherical Brownian particle, okay? And we say that it has radius A, mass capital M, and it's at some position X, which changes with time. Of course, it has associated velocity U that also changes with time, okay? And uh, it's in a fluid which can be, you know, a liquid or a gas and has a vis viscosity e represented by eta, okay? So we, let's just write down the Newton's equation of motion for this. So what it would be, it's like m times du by dt equals to f, okay? Where f is, of course, is a function of time and is the net instantaneous force acting on the particle, right? So this is what my Newton's equation of motion would be for the Brownian particle. Now, the big question is, even though we have written it like this, where is this force coming from? Where does this force come from? Can you tell me? And what would, what is your guess about this force? Anyone? So the electromagnetic force between particles. So due to viscosity. Electromagnetic force. Okay. That's uh, that's very deep. Anyone else? Viscosity. So viscosity of the fluid. Viscosity. Fluid. Viscosity of the fluid. R particle and fluid particles. What particles? Our particle and the fluid particles. So basically you all want to, yeah, basically you, you want to say that my Brownian particle is interacting with its surrounding and that interaction is giving, generating some kind of a force, right? Or, or it, uh, someone says pressure differential. Okay, so let's see. Answer? is the interaction of the Brownian particle with the surrounding medium is as simple as that. And like we won't, you know, I mean, we will slowly start digging deeper. So now the force F is known in principle when, you know, if you know the position of the molecule surrounding the Brownian particle, okay, uh, as a function of uh, time. So what I'm saying, if you know the position of the molecules which are surrounding your Brownian particle, okay, then the force F is known as a function of time. Then what does it imply? It, it immediately says that then F is not random, okay? But this is ridiculous, you know? However, this approach to look for an exact expression for this for, force is impractical. Can anyone tell me why this is impractical? There are a lot of uh, particles uh, tracking all of them. There, uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, fluid molecules that are interacting with the Brownian particles. So can we, is it realistic to have hold on, of, on, on all of them that we will know their position, you know, by measurement process or by some other process uh, precisely that we would be, you know, able to say something about F? And any, any, in any case, there are so many particles around the Brownian particle or molecules around the um, Brownian particle. Does it make even sense to try to look for exact expression for, you know, F in terms of uh, contribution emerging uh, from these, you know, molecules around it? Does it make sense or no? No, right? Okay, now answer the following answer the following. Let's say you have a fluid, okay? And forget about all that we have been, uh, you know, talking about so far. And you take a ball, okay? Or you, uh, and you move it to the fluid, okay? So what do you experience? I mean, when you move the ball through the fluid or you take a ball and keep it in the fluid flow. So you will see that it's like the force that acts on is the dominant component is the frictional force, right? Do you agree with me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So to our first approximation, what we can assume, this interaction of the Brownian particle with the surrounding medium, which is generating, you know, the force which is acting on the Brownian particle is dominated by, the, uh, by a force which is frictional in nature, right? And the frictional force is proportional to the velocity and acts opposite and opposes the motion, right? So we can say the frictional force is minus nu times u, okay? 
that simple so you do that okay so you just use this uh, frictional force in your equation of motion and the result that you get is uh, mass times du by dt is roughly you know minus nu times u okay so can you uh, and this equation can be easily solved right and the answer is written right here i mean there is nothing that you know you don't want me to you know solve it how to solve first order od right so all you need you know to know the exact solution i mean that is u as a function of time you all you need to know the initial value of u right so what you have u as e to the power minus nu t by m multiplied by the initial value of u so tell me what this expression tells you about the motion of the brownian particle it will settle in a uh, same direction but with a reduced magnitude reducing but participation anyone else i mean all of you are welcome to yes question like uh, we, we can't get any information about any change in direction of the particle it's just a like say u is in the x direction so u keeps on dec decreasing as t goes to infinity hmm. so if you look at speed means uh, yes someone else is there. saying something yes can you be a tensorial okay so what i have done here i have simplified everything and i am focusing you know on 1d picture there is part of my particle brown in particle is moving along a line you can make it 3d but for the time being you know this is spherically symmetric you know everything is nice so that you know we are like with a simple nice expression i have an interpretation for this so um, i'm not you sure how correct that would be but yes. uh so friction is modeled like uh, minus v times u so this is more of an empirical formula than a theoretical one in which we are modeling friction with the generally used form and equating it to m du by dt yeah. so so when when i mean you have you heard of the stokes drag and other things uh, related right. stuff yes. right so it is in the same spirit basically okay So, so now we moved from theoretical uh, and taken some empirical facts into account. Is that so? yeah? So, so that is way. I mean, how 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 will this uh, frictional force will arise? I mean, I'm saying the Brownian particle is interacting with the surrounding medium, but how exactly this frictional force will arise, or rather, you know, how any frictional force will arise through collisions with the you know system under. I mean, you know, with our Brownian particle, right? Right. We, when you move your brownian particle there would be uh, you know collision with the fluid molecules and that will give right to viscosity which will oppose it so that's that's what this you know uh, expression on the right hand side is telling me so it's like very that's why i invoked a very simple analogy that you take a ball and move it so i broke it down to that simplicity level okay, okay. so now now coming back to the solution when you stare hard at the solution what do you see so as time goes to infinity or let's say you you wait longer and longer i mean let's say uh, your brownian particle had some initial velocity u uh, or initial speed u0 and now you solve this equation and you wait for uh, long enough what do you see the brownian particle would come to rest does that make sense i mean so far we had been talking up what what we have been talking about we have been talking about you know brownian motion is something where you have a, a particle you know dust particle pollen or whatever and it moves you know randomly uh, it's like incessant motion you know non uh, it, it moves non stop in an irregular fashion right so we have considered only dissipating force friction is a dissipative force so from yes. that equation it should come to rest but i'm not sure in reality that would happen yes so this means the assumption that we made here we made here assumption right that the force that is acting on the particle is dominated by a frictional force so it's not the right assumption okay so we need to modify it so uh, what the expression was telling us 
that the velocity of the brownian particle decays to zero at long times but we know for sure let's say <clears throat> uh, that at thermal equilibrium the mean square velocity is given by kbt by m okay and that is in absolute contradiction with the above answer right since my brownian part particle is in thermal equilibrium you know with the fluid so if nothing then at least it should have uh, this particular mean square velocity because of the thermal agitation right and this clearly shows that the assumption that we had made that the force f is dominated by the frictional force requires some serious modification and where do we get the hint from the hint is from the trajectory of an individual from an observation that the trajectory of in an individual brownian particle is random and this suggests inclusion of a random or fluctuating force okay here i have represented that by script f so we will modify our equation of motion for the brownian particle now and what we will do we will write m times du by dt on the left hand side and balance it with the force uh, acting on the particle but this force would now be split into two parts okay so the first part would be a systematic part which is coming from the you know viscous action of the fluid and second part is the fluctuating force which is acting on the particle and both of these are coming from the surrounding medium itself okay and this particular equation i mean for the brownian particle written in this form is called the langevin equation okay so what uh, what has just happened so uh, we have partitioned the total force that is acting on the particle Uh, into a systematic part a friction and a fluctuating part that is noise okay and both of these come from the interaction with the surrounding and uh, since both of these are coming from the surrounding and by surrounding i mean you know the fluid which you can regard as a thermal bath also okay so the viscous force is trying to or the frictional force is trying to damp the motion right it is trying to bring the particle to a rest state and the noise will kick around it and you know keep it going and both of them are coming from the same fluid or the surrounding so it should not be we should not be surprised if later on we find that there is some fundamental relation between the friction and noise right because the same surrounding is giving rise to both these uh, components of the force total force okay and you will see later that this is where one of the most general uh, theorem uh, in uh, statistical physics comes into play called you know fluctuation dissipation theorem okay dissipation you have seen is linked to the uh, frictional process your voice is cut off i think so you have been muted so you are muted someone muted me it seems so till where you were able to hear me so we heard that there can be a relation there will be a relation between the two parts and after that we couldn't hear anything Okay, so basically, uh, can you see my slide? Uh, no, not yet. I need to share it again. So you can see my slide. 
yes sir yes sir yes sir yes i think i was on the last point where where i was saying that uh, it should not come as a surprise to us if we find some fundamental relation between the friction and noise right yes sir yes ha uh-huh. so so what is going on here i mean i'm saying you know it should not come as a surprise because both these uh components of the source are coming from the interaction of the brownian particle with its surrounding so the same surrounding is responsible for the two components so the friction and I, and i was saying that you know it will uh, lead to one of the most general general theorem in the statistical physics called as fluctuation dissipation theorem and we will see it in several uh, avatars uh, in this uh, you know the set of lectures and you will see that uh, the friction part is of course related to dissipation and the noise part is the fluctuation so the name fluctuation dissipation and we eventually see that there's some relation between the two okay so then i moved on to you know discuss the nature of the fluctuating force we should say something about it so so there are two you know view points okay so one is a very really usual one that we have been talking about so far that you know this fluctuating oh, someone says he can't hear again can't hear me is it so because i'm mute no i'm not no sir we can hear you okay so because this fluctuating how 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 is this fluctuating force arising okay that's what we want to look at so now i'm saying this you know one of the view point is which is the very usually and commonly uh, presented one and it says that this fluctuating force comes from the collisions of the brownian particles with the molecules of the surrounding fluid okay no magic and we have been talking about it okay but then what we say this fluctuation force varies extremely rapidly during collisions over the time of any observation you know so then what then what we want to do that we we will you know just try to quantify and summarize the uh, fluctuating force by just first and second moment so when i say first moment that you just take the average okay average is zero and you understand what i mean by that okay and then i just compute the correlation function of this force at different times okay and i see that they are delta correlated okay so the averages that i'm talking about are time averages here you know these uh, angular brackets denote time averages over an infinitesimal interval okay and this d which appears there quantifies the strength of the fluctuation fluctuating force and of course Uh, since the delta is sitting there uh, so there is no correlation between collisions in any distinct time interval dt and dt prime let's say okay and the uh, rest of the statistics is specified by saying that the distribution is gaussian and uh, governed by these two moments given there that is the mean is zero and, and you know uh, the second moment is uh, given Uh, you know the correlate uh, i mean it is delta correlated in time basically now what is the second interpretation second interpretation is uh, you know the randomness of the brownian noise is completely determined by the initial state of the surrounding fluid okay that makes sense right so w- but at the same time what is our expectation that whatever you know this uh, langevin equation that we wrote down to compute uh, you know the dynamics of the brownian particle the results obtained based on this uh, langevin equation or langevin description should be independent of the initial state okay and must not and must depend only on the statistical distribution of the noise that this brownian particle is encountering and in such a situation the average uh in the averages that appeared in the previous equation that is uh, you know here the first and the second moment they are now instead of being time averages they are uh, averages over the initial states different initial states okay so we'll just keep these two in our head and you know and uh, move ahead so this is our langevin equation 
right? Now, if I ask you to solve it, how many of you can solve it? And the uh, nature of the force has already been specified to you. The script F, the fluctuating force, has been specified here, okay? It's a statistical description. Now I'm telling you to, so, uh, you know, if you know how to solve it. So if I say, if you multiply by the integrating factor on both sides of the equation and proceed, uh, can you see that? So Green's function. Green's function. But what I'm saying, let's say I multiply it by the, you know, integrating factor on both the sides. I mean, as simple as that. First order, yes, you know, the, right? which you can see in the solution here. So this is, I'm not doing, you know, explicitly this math. I mean, if you want, I can do it. But this I've already given you in the form of my old personal notes. So if you go there and, you know, but, you know, the notations and things would be, could be very different, but that math is there. I mean, if you want, you can read from RK Patria or, I mean, you don't have to read anything. I mean, you can just sit down and just compute it, okay? So if you multiply it by the integrating factor and integrating factor is exponential, uh, uh, you know, exponential to the power a combination of uh, viscosity, time and the mass. Okay. And uh, you do little calculation and you will get a solution which is of this form. Hmm. Now focus on the right hand side. So the term one is responsible for the exponential decay. It's very obvious, right? E to the power minus nu t divided by m. So in the long time limit, the first term will uh, just decay to zero, okay? And now look at term two on the RHS. This is the extra velocity kick generated by the random noise, okay? The random noise is where? Random noise is sitting in the fluctuating force, F. And then, let's say what we are interested in now, the mean square, dissipa, uh, means, uh, mean, mean square velocity, okay? Why we are interested in mean square velocity? Because we are in thermal equilibrium, and we know uh, what, what is the mean square velocity of a particle in thermal equilibrium, right? And now we have explicitly solved our Langevin equation, let's say. I mean, not explicitly, there is still something to be, you know, resolved. So if we now take the, uh, you know, square of this and do proper averaging, then we should be able to relate it with the mean square velocity that we already know from thermodynamic considerations. Okay, so now we are heading into fluctuation dissipation theorem. So mean square velocity, if you if you take this expression, okay, and you just square it and take a take an average, okay. So on the RHS you have two terms, right? So if you now square it, so the very first term, this very first term will give you will will come as a square, right? It's here. And this will decay to zero in long time, okay? And besides this, you will get a cross term coming from the first term and the second term, right? Two cross terms and they are first order in noise. So because this is, uh, the F appears or the this term appears only F, okay? Now, if you take a uh, proper averaging, it will go to zero. Why it will go to zero? Because we have already specified that the mean is mean of a, uh, mean of the fluctuating force is zero. I mean, when we were specifying the uh, statistical moments of the fluctuating force. Now, if you look at the uh, third term, third term will come from the square of this. Okay, so this is like second order term in noise. Okay. So F is appearing two times. So this is slightly non-trivial. It's there in the old notes that I gave you in, a, in some form. You can compute it. So uh, I would say you go back and compute it. And if you are not able to do it, and then we can do it together. But I am very sure you would be able to do it. 
So you take this, okay, and now make use of the you know average of the product of two noise that you have already seen. You know, basically, I'm asking you to make use of this fact, okay? The second moment. So now, if you make use of the second moment, then what will happen? A delta function will uh, appear. And that will take care of one of the time integrals, okay? And if and then the the remaining time integral is very easy to perform, right? And the mean square velocity, then you can very simple. Okay, there's a equal to sign missing here. I'm sorry for that. So mean square velocity would be simply the contribution from the first term, okay, which is decaying uh, exponentially, and then a term which is of this form okay now again let's go back to the long time limit and the last term here in this expression sir, yes sir here are we taking an ensemble average or, or a time average in the u square the bracket there so what do you think it should be an ensemble average right because it, it depends on t the right hand side you have answered yourself? Yes, I just wanted to confirm. Okay. So, so you know, you, you, so the last term, last term is, uh, will be, you know, going to zero in the uh, long time limit, right? And what is this limiting value? D by nu m, right? And the first term is, of course, going to zero, okay? And I have said that there is a typo here, equality sign is missing. So now what you see that in this limit, that is in this long time limit, the mean square velocity must relax to the equilibrium value, kBT by m, this we know for sure, right? Because the Brownian particle is in thermal equilibrium. So as a consequence, if you do little arrangement, rearrangement, you would find that this D, okay, is, new times kbt okay so what is happening here and d was the strength of the random noise okay or the fluctuating force and this gets related to the magnitude nu of the friction or dissipation right so we have obtained a relation between the noise and the dissipation okay and this is and what does this express? This expresses, you know, a balance between a friction that is trying to uh, drive the system to a dead state uh, that we very explicitly saw when we neglected the fluctuation part and the noise, which is, you know, kicking the particle and, uh, and making it move around. So that is kind of a balance between the two. And where is this coming into picture? And this balance is required to ensure thermal equilibrium right at long times this we explicitly saw that if we are ignoring one of them then it's not compatible with the thermal equilibrium so now you know this thing was uh, so einstein you know proved that this i mean this d is actually related to the diffusion constant that we saw in the diffusion equation yesterday and uh, Einstein had shown that this diffusion constant of the Brownian particle is related to its mobility, okay? And, and this is where, you know, and this provides a very good basis for the experimental verification of the Brownian motion, okay? Is in, in fact related to the thermal motion of the molecules, basically. So what we have seen, so uh, and you know, as I've already said, this is something very deeper and we will come back to it. I mean, these fluctuation dissipation relations and in different, I mean, there's one more form of it, which we will look at. So basically today, that's all I had to say. So maybe I will stop here today. As I had mentioned in my message that uh, I will keep the lecture very short. Sir, I have a question. 